Our next hero is what is known in the psychic community as an empath, one with the ability to experience the state of mind of another. While studying literature in her native Cairo, she discovered that by merely reading a sample of one's writing, whether it be a piece of fiction, a poem, a grocery list, a passive aggressive post-it note, uh, she could get an, an, an intimate glimpse into that person's affairs. Picking up any scrap of writing she could, she soon realized the depths of humanity's depravity, which often seemed to blot out the shine of goodness. Rather than hide from this awesome responsibility, she chose to travel the world through books by enrolling in the MFA program here, where she reads as much as she can and works to rewrite the narrative of justice. In the cowardly hearts of men, she is the Scribner, but to her bookish compatriots, she is Noha Albadri. Um, hi guys. So. Since for the last year, I've been working on the same book over and over. This is what I'm going to be, read from, be reading from tonight. Chapter one. I never discovered the reason Yem picked her, nor do I know whether she was chosen randomly or after careful consideration. Who knows how Yem's mind works anyway? Who cares how the mysterious wreckage of depressed minds operates? What I know is this. One random night, Ian walked into, ha ha, a bar. He asked one of the bartenders for a drink and asked the other whether she would work for him. Doing what? Nera asked, disinterested. I want you to make sure I don't kill myself. I imagine she cackled in that hag-like way of hers as she rolled her eyes and walked to the other end of the bar, hissing a variation of, I don't get paid enough to deal with this shit. Let's step back for a second and take a look at Nora that first night. Emaciated, medium height, mid-twenties, black hair like barbed wire snaking midway down her back, brown eyes shrouded by way too much makeup. In short, your typical step away from drug addiction, half step away short of pretty nobody, server in a generic bar. She smoked as she mixed drinks, that overcompensated for their blandness by way too much liquor. She fiddled too often with her black crop top. Yen absently noted, pulling it over her chest, nothing particularly notable, but enough to cover her tiny excuse of a shirt. For his part, Yen sipped one glass of whiskey after another. Three drinks later, Nara was back at his side of the bar. So, huh? Nara threw distracted. Will you work for me? Nara rolled her eyes. So funny, she humored him. Cad, her manager, had lectured her and yelled and cursed, the customer is always right, way too many times for her to have let her cruel cynicism take charge of her retorts. Just a miserable drunk loser, she told herself. Smile and politely decline. Yen looked at her, wearing his trademark earnest expression. I'm not joking. Look, it's been a long night and I'm really not in the mood. Are you going to order another drink? Nora fiddled with the split ends of her hair, a sure sign she was losing whatever mincical amount of patience she had. Sure, but I'd still like you to consider working for me. I'll offer you as much money as you want. Yam smiled in a way Nora would later describe as utterly devoid of spirit and emotion. Made my skin crawl, she'd say. Suicide watch, she asked and scoffed. That's what they have nut houses for. Or call a hotline or something. Now please excuse me, she said as she walked away. Wait, I really don't want to do either of those things. It won't be a hard job, really. It would just be time consuming. But as I said, I'll offer you as much money as you want. Just think about it. Yen persisted. Nara was getting seriously annoyed now. Look, dude, if this is your way of, like, hitting on me, if... It's not working, and I don't screw for money. I don't know what sort of crap you're trying to pull. I'm not insinuating or asking for anything of a sexual nature. All I want from you is to make sure I stay alive, Yen said, as though what he was asking was perfectly normal and rational. Nara looked him over for the first time, noticed the handsome sculpted features, the plain but obviously expensive clothes, the golden watch wrapped around his wrist. There really was no reason she could think of for some rich, good-looking guy to make such an odd request. 
She tried to decide whether he looked sad, but his expression revealed nothing. Pause. Yen wrote of all he couldn't feel. He could feel nothing. Emotions stuffed as blocked nostrils. He tried and he failed and he tried again, already foreseeing that again he would fail. So again he failed and tried again. His whole existence seemed locked in the repetition of one action, never completed. The torture of almost, but not quiet. Like climbing the stairs, but a step away from the landing, he constantly found himself back at the starting point. He was aware of what tastes his absurd curse should incite. The way one looks at a dish one never tried and sees its ingredients, potato thyme mushroom, and so knows he should taste potato thyme mushrooms. Yen knew what he should be, disgruntled, frustrated, exasperated, mad, all those foreign islands, like a secret everyone is in on except Yen, black sheep. Even boredom was beyond his reach. He played the same scene over because otherwise there was nothing to do. And wrote one story after another, then another, and more others, inscribing characters with habits and flaws and patterns and voices, moving them with the skill and precision of a chess waltz. Wrote and was published and wrote more and was published more and tried, oh how he tried, to feel rather than understand, to participate rather than watch and hunger, but nothing came. He was brilliant and wholly devoid of all. Even sadness at his condition was beyond him, so he went on producing, well-oiled machine that he was, and waited for the day when he should feel, believing such a day would come because without such belief, he would be left with nothing and time was so very long without something to look forward to. Such a person, all seasoned intellect, odd not to know, not to realize, that wanting itself was feeling, a branch of desire. It always seems the more intelligent and self-aware an individual is, the more said individual's intelligence and awareness fills him in regards to himself. Is it any wonder that he wanted to die? On pause. You expect me to believe you walked in here and just decided to ask a random bartender to keep you from offing yourself for a big salary? Yes, Yen smiled. Okay, I'm thinking about it. Hmm, no. Don't make me call one of the boys to kick your ass out of here, Nora said, cocking her head towards the fat security guy by the door in what she hoped was a menacing fashion. Yen said nothing. An hour later, Nora, who had just finished her shift, stepped out, lit a cigarette, and found Yen standing there, smiling in the same creepy way. What the hell? If you try anything, I swear, I will taser you faster than you can blink. Nora hissed, hand dropping the cigarette and flying into her purse, started inching back. Oh, I have no intention of hurting you. I apologize if I scared you. I didn't mean to. I just wanted to ask you to consider my request. As he stood there, face suddenly drawn and unbearably haggard as he gazed at her, Nora knew whoever Yen was. He wasn't interested in attacking her. Nora never knew what possessed her at that moment. Maybe she was just bored with her life, or maybe it was another one of her potentially disastrous impulses. So all I'd have to do is hang around and make sure you stay alive. Pretty much, Yen replied, beaming at her, Hazel's pupils lit. How many hours a day are we talking? Nora didn't know why she was participating in encouraging this force. Depends on the day. Some days it might be one hour, another it might be 20. That's the unpleasant side of the job. How much money are we talking about? Her eyes, I'm sure, gleamed with greed. Thank you.